<laughs> spring break next week. Yeah. Yeah. Spring break next week. this locomotive that was on display in Lawton Park many years ago and I was essentially reared out on the property and I grew up with this locomotive in my life and it has uh, catalyzed this this passion for history and, and for rail history especially that I that I've developed and uh, I've just spent years uh, you know hanging around the locomotive and the organization and then uh, something I do um, in the summer season and in the spring is I also am a preservation consultant slash locomotive mechanic for hire that goes around and, and if there's a steam locomotive in Kentucky or California um, that can benefit from some goofy 25 year olds help or, or per, uh, assistance in any way shape or form I uh, go down there and work on those and um, it's 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 enough to keep you up at nights I mean I don't have a whole lot of free time but uh, but it's pretty awesome <laughs> a lot of the older viewers will remember that um, locomotive that sat at uh at 4th Street and uh, North Clinton. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you made mention when uh, former uh, Mayor Mike Burns passed away of his uh, involvement uh, with with that locomotive. Yeah, this, this steam locomotive, the 765, it's uh, one of five mainline, as we call them, steam locomotives in existence in the country right now. It's the largest operating east of the Mississippi, and it's really a Fort Wayne incarnate in its history and how it came to be preserved and then saved by the organization uh, is really unique. Uh, in the um, World War II, uh, the nickel plate, and, and prior to that, uh, ran through the middle of downtown. Fort Wayne was such a massive railroad hub at that point. And the nickel plate, uh, because they built on the old canal bed, were right downtown uh, along Superior Street there. And the nickel plate, because they had so many trains per day and passenger trains and three tracks downtown, uh, they caused quite a bottleneck. And nobody could develop north of the city. It was, it was a huge traffic jam all the time. And uh, years of, uh, of hearing this cry from the city to elevate the nickel plate, the railroad, flush with cash in the post-war era, decided, okay, we're finally going to do it. We're going to elevate the nickel plate. Um, and... Uh, they started construction in 1953 and ended in 1955, and they opened up the overpass uh, with a nickel plate steam locomotive number 767 that broke mm. the banner. And then years later, somebody said, hey, why don't we get that locomotive that broke the banner um, and put it on display to commemorate this incredible economic development project, which really opened the city's uh, north side up for development. Um, and uh, the nickel plate had kept the 765 in really good condition, and they just quietly changed the number. Um, and that's when it was uh, put on display in 1962 at Lawton Park there to commemorate that, that huge project. I mean, it was a $3.5 million project uh, at that time. It's... I mean, it's, it was one of Fort Wayne's first major projects, I think, of that kind, especially in the post-war era. And, and Mayor Balls had quite a bit to do with it in terms of yeah, uh, I mean, it, being the, present. Yeah, I mean, the legacy of, uh, of Elevate the Nickel Plate spans, I think, at least three or four mayoral administrations. Uh, I mean, that was a huge thing, and, and it was unique because in the years prior... Um, uh, I mean, at the turn of the 19th century, the Wabash and the Pennsylvania Railroads had already elevated their tracks because they saw the trouble coming and they had such a huge footprint on the south side of the city. And I think at that point, the south side was the most industrious and the beehive of activity when it came to railroad stuff. Well, and that, and that brings us to how Fort Wayne developed with the railroads in, in, the, in the 20th century in terms of our geographic footprint. You had the railroads elevated uh, as a Wabash in, in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and opened up areas like Old Mill Road and Southwood Park and further south and and uh, development was driven south. That mm -hmm. was uh, where most Fort Wayne development occurred. And then you get right on the cusp of the 60s, the late 50s, the, the elevation that opens up the north is done. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that you have the uh, 30 bypass constructed right. uh, and, and completed uh, early to mid 60s. And then in the 70s this explosion in St. Joe Township and Washington Township of development, which really to this day has um, um, uh, uh, fueled mm -hmm. Fort Wayne and fueled uh, suburban housing development. Right. There's been the additional part, the 4th District, uh, <laughs> in a Boyd Township, but uh, that, that really sort of spelled uh, um, that development slowed on the south side of Fort Wayne and exploded mm -hmm. uh, north. And we've kind of been dealing as a community with yeah. um, uh, uh, the outcome of that uh, 
of that that railroad elevation. Yeah, it's it's amazing to think that something that was done in '55, you know, a couple of miles of rail downtown, and just the ramifications that had. I mean, the South Side dried up, and everything shot north. I think prior to '55, the Memorial Coliseum was really the only thing that was that was up there. Well, one of the other things that drove was uh, the growth of Parkview Hospital, mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that Parkview became the dominant um, hospital of the three, and uh, 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 you know, had a, had a tremendous uh, growth pattern, and it's now is uh, again leaping yeah. further north. Is really a, a result of uh, of that development going uh, north and northeast. Yeah, a, a couple of pieces of ribbon rail can have quite an impact on a community. I mean, even years later, it's pretty wild. <laughs> now let's go back a, a hundred and fifty years. <laughs> gotcha. And talk about uh, development and Fort Wayne's industrialization. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how Fort Wayne came to be and how it attracted uh, uh, lots of German workers and, mm -hmm. uh, and other Eastern European workers. I was um, touched uh, a few years ago, the uh, Fort Wayne Allen County Historical Society, the History Center. Uh, Mike Hawfield, uh, when he was the director, contacted me and he asked me if we had any photographs of, and they were really my great-grandfather's brothers who served in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't believe so. Uh, James Harper, who was one of the brothers, became sort of a spokesman for Civil War, kind of made a little career in the latter part of the mm -hmm. of the 19th century giving uh, t uh, talks about what it was to be uh, a Union soldier. But they had letters that one of my grandfather's cousins had given to the History Center, and, it, and they were going to publish this, an exchange between my great great-grandfather and, and two of his sons who were serving in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. The thing that struck me, uh, he's writing this letter, he's asking what they need in terms of supplies. He goes to uh, Schnelker Dry Goods, and the Schnelker family's very much intertwined with New Haven. And what surprised me in the letters was he was able to take that to the train station in New Haven. <laughs> and they had it very shortly thereafter. They were with uh, the group of troops going through Tennessee mm -hmm. and into Georgia. And it just brought home um, how quickly the nation was being transformed and how quickly goods could could uh, uh, could be advanced. And that was during the 1860s. Yeah, the the railroads were the original internet in that in that capacity. They they made the world a smaller, more accessible and connected place. And Fort Wayne was lucky in so much as it's on the way to Chicago from just about every railroad in the East. And over time, Fort Wayne becomes such a, a huge manufacturing hub and a railroad hub. Uh, they used to build locomotives, passenger cars, freight cars, etc., cetera, um, where the post office stands right now. And that's um, really interesting, uh, the fact that, I mean, people made their entire lives making these machines, and when the locomotives and such were, were being completed, they had builder's plates on them that said, Made in Fort Wayne. And there was that Chrysler commercial during the Super Bowl um, that talked sure. about what Detroit does, and this is Detroit. Well, that's what Fort Wayne was. And, and a lot of people today, they'll call a locomotive, um, like the 765, a Lima, because it was built in the, uh, the Lima Locomotive Works in Ohio. Well, if we had any locomotives left that were built in Fort Wayne in the, eight, uh, you know, the 1800s or the early 1900s, they would be called a Fort Wayne. Um, so we were so productive. I mean, the railroads were kind of like the steel dynamics and the Raytheons uh, of the 19th and 20th centuries. And they, the, each neighborhood almost had its own rail yard. Uh, Nebraska had the Nickel Plate Railroad. Um, the South Side had the Wabash Railroad and the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, Bloomingdale had the New York Central. And coupled with the, the mainline passenger railroads and the inner urban network, you could go anywhere in the country, almost anywhere in Fort Wayne, just by stepping on an inner urban or a passenger train. And people talk about high-speed rail as if it's some brand new thing that China or Japan has, sure. has developed. But we had it. I mean, you could get on a train in 1940 at Baker Street Station and get behind a locomotive that was built in 1920 and go 120 miles an hour. And that's sustained speeds. And it's pretty amazing to consider just how much of a part of the network of the General Railroad System we were at one point. Uh, and it, we were a major hub for the Pennsylvania, uh, a major place for the Nickel Plate Road. I mean, we were a place that, that built great things and was part of this great system. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's hard to tell now. A lot of people think Baker Street is all that's left. But I mean, if you go to the um, Nebraska neighborhood, you can still see where the old Nickel Plate Roundhouse used to be. And every one of these yards carved out a niche in their own neighborhoods and employed hundreds and hundreds of people. I think one of the things, is, since I posted that uh, you were going to be the guest on this program on yeah. Facebook and on Twitter with a number of people who uh, put messages up that, mm -hmm. you know, my dad went to work for the Nickel Plate and my granddad worked. This was a railroading town. Yeah. I think it, it, as I look over to the to the west mm -hmm. from downtown uh, uh, past the St. Mary's Railroad Bridge, mm 
um, which is where the the uh, aqueduct mm -hmm. was for the uh, Wabash uh, in Erie Canal. But the, the old nickel plate yards are elevated, and so they're not really visible too much right. from the street. That's a lot of acreage there. Yeah, it's... A lot of green. It's almost an urban park setting, and but for the fact that there's still an active track running mm -hmm. through there, it, uh, it kind of sparks some ideas of uh, things that have been done, such as New York's High Line and, mm -hmm. and so on. This, th there's this very big green space that's elevated that no one quite knows is there. Right. There's some neighborhood kids who do, and it <laughs> yep. poses some yep. safety concerns for the, for the railroad. Mm -hmm. You talked about railroads being the Raytheon and Steel Dynamics of their mm -hmm. day, but, they are, but Norfolk Southern... Uh, the railroads here are are still. Yeah, they're, they're the railroads. They're the railroads of today. Right. And they're fueling. Um, they they fuel so much of our economy. I've served uh, on the as a city council representative to the Economic Development Alliance. Certainly, there's a push there for intermodal mm -hmm. uh, hubs, either at Cassad or along Adams Center Road. Right. But there's a change coming in terms of getting. Um, uh, better rail connections between the shipping yards around Norfolk, Virginia, mm -hmm. up through the Appalachians. That's going to increase traffic right. here over the next several years, both Norfolk and Southern, and I think CSX mm -hmm. line a little uh, a little north of yeah, us. And it's, it's, it's going scaring, to increase increase traffic tremendously. It's scaring people in Chicago because at some point everything has to enter Chicago, and they know with the shipping lanes being opened in the in the east, everything is gonna is gonna come through this area and, uh, on its way to Chicago. So I mean. It's, it's amazing to think that, I mean, Norfolk Southern and uh, CSX, which leases to the Chicago, Fort Wayne, um, and Eastern, which is part of Rail America, they are still doing their jobs that they did, that the railroads did 100 years ago. Uh, it might be on a smaller scale, and because passenger rail has diminished greatly, uh, people don't really understand railroads or trains as, as they would have uh, when they would have ridden a train every weekend. I mean, I know people that, you know, used to take the train up to... Uh, Angola or to Pleasant Lake or, or elsewhere just on a weekend just for a day and that type of thing and uh, No, but yeah, you're you're absolutely right Norfolk Southern especially is a major player in town both in terms of jobs and the industries that they serve I mean GM wouldn't be where GM is sure. if it wasn't for the railroad and Warren Buffett's uh, play for uh, <laughs> uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe mm -hmm. uh, he, you know he said uh, We really are going to have to rely on railroads. It's it's very much a growth mm -hmm. Uh, industry and uh, Fort Wayne is still very much uh, a hub. One of those other things about rail uh, passenger traffic was for all those railroad workers that were in Fort Wayne, most of them had a, a lifetime pass right. that survived them and, and would go to their spouse so mm -hmm. people could travel uh, anywhere. My wife's uh, grandmother, uh, or her grandfather was uh, employed by the Pennsylvania Railroad mm -hmm. And uh, one of the key things that her <laughs> grandmother had, and she was somewhat younger than he was, was mm -hmm. that was that railroad pass. Yeah, it's it's amazing to think, you know, we had a half dozen railroads, a half dozen stations. You had your pick. If any town you wanted to go to, you know, Chicago, Baltimore, wherever, uh, even Mackinac Island. I love to tell people that they could have gotten on a train at Baker Street and taken the train all the way to Mackinac Island, to the island, because they would ferry the passenger car over the lake to the island. I mean, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. But it's, like I mentioned, because rail has kind of diminished in the public's eye, especially passenger rail, to know what we once had, and, and there's people that are advocating to try to get that back. There's a, there's a big disconnect because of that culture change, I think. But yeah, we've had people come to the shop, and they have photos of their grandfather or their father on the front of one of the locomotives. We had a, a woman during our Santa trains come out, and she was eight or nine years old, mm -hmm. and they were visiting the engines uh, that were parked in New Haven at the time, and one of them was the 763 and the 764, but not the 765. And, you know, so many people come to us, and they're like, you know, my dad rode on this. My dad was the engineer. And this was, you know, if it wasn't this engine, it was an engine like it, and it was a mm -hmm. part of all these people's lives. And the degrees of separation are very few. I mean, someone has a relative somewhere that worked for the railroad. And in Fort Wayne, you couldn't turn around without tripping over a rail at one point. Sure. So, <laughs> Tell a little bit about what um, kind of historic artifacts of passenger rail still exist uh, in Fort Wayne. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, as a wildcatter back uh, in the 60s, um, they would take all the wildcat uh, baseball players mm -hmm. to a major league uh, ball game. And... Uh, Actually, we left from the Wabash Station mm -hmm. there by the St. Vincent de Paul Society, walked up the steps. Yeah. That train took us to Tiger Stadium, mm -hmm. and it was kind of neat to be able to go out to New Haven and then angle off yeah, uh, right on, up the, north on the to way Detroit. To, uh, to Detroit. Yeah. But you have the Baker Street Station. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Fort Wayne Outfitters uh, along Cass Street. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and then tell us a little bit about the uh, uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, railroad station that sits waiting for someone to restore it. Uh, well, the uh, the Cass Street one, or um... well, no, the. Uh, uh, the one that's sitting oh, on the old the, fort. The inner urban property. station, yeah. yeah. The uh, the inner urban history. Uh, there is a, a station uh, that that was discovered many years ago. What was the name of the lot that someone discovered in? I can't remember off the top of the, my head. Uh, Mrs. Tamman owned this uh, house uh, very near the what was Broadview. Mm -hmm. uh, later, the Broadview right. lumber yards there at New Haven Avenue and Wayne Trace, mm -hmm. and they had used it as a converted it to a workshop. Right. And the inner urbans, uh, they had all these unique little stations that were popped up along the line. And this particular structure uh, was it languished on this this property, kind of unknown for many years. And it, because of its size, I mean, it was able to save people noticing it and tearing it down, or it was easy to move too. Uh, but that's really one of the only relics of, of the inner urbans we've still got in the area. I was just um, walking uh, off Harrison, and there the parking lot there has what I presume to be old streetcar or inner urban tracks, sure. kind of on bordering the parking lot. Um, so, and there's some streets where as the concrete wears away, you can see the rails underneath. I think there at Main and Broadway, I think, uh, is one that you can see. Um, but yeah, there are few and far between these little, these little relics that are just waiting for people to know more about them or to discover about them. And they, they are the keys to a much bigger picture and story of Fort Wayne at one point. Uh, and it might be a building, but those buildings have a lot of stories to tell. Uh, one of them I helped uh, get donated from Norfolk Southern mm -hmm. is the New Haven uh, old Wabash uh, train station. Mm -hmm. still sitting there. It's in need of, uh, need of a few angels to uh, get it restored. Yeah, well, it's but, it's uh, had a few lately, I've heard. So. It has had a few. <laughs> there, the New Haven Heritage Society is, uh, uh, is working on that. Mm -hmm. We've got the, the uh, and they keep calling it the, the New York Railroad, the Puffer Belly Trail mm -hmm. that's uh, heading north. Uh, I've, I've attempted to get them to call it by the Fort Wayne and Jackson right. name because it really tells what sort of trail could where it used to go. On where, the line, where, yeah. where it uh, used to go. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the Grand Rapids uh, uh, abandoned Indiana, yeah. uh, corridor that's uh, t to the west of that that runs mm -hmm. up kind of parallel to Lima Road mm -hmm. uh, through to Huntertown. Uh, but we've, we've, we have a lot of active corridors, too. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up uh, two blocks from the, from, uh, the train tracks uh, in New Haven. And, uh, it's, and, and my wife, where she grew up in Ohio, where we live now, we can hear the uh, we can hear the train right. on a good night with the windows open, <laughs> but certainly in the fourth district, uh, uh, it's kind of bounded uh, by railroads. Yeah. By railroads, <laughs> and then you've got uh, the north south railroad that goes right through uh, Wayndale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. Um, the only railroads we lost really um, at any great length were the inner urbans, and the New York Central dried up just because of. Um, its relation to ship to the rest of the general system uh, in the 70s. But yeah, I mean, we still, the actual infrastructure as far as the rail goes, we still have a lot of what once was. Um, it might be greatly diminished in its capacity or, or in how well maintained it is or to what standard it's maintained. The, the tracks that the CF&E operate on that go from the old Pennsylvania Railroad tracks that would have gone from Baker Street Station to... Uh, to Chicago, you could have taken these famous trains like the Broadway Limited. There used to be two tracks there that were good for the 120 miles, and, and now I think the, the top speed limit is about uh, 25 or 30 miles an hour. There was a, a statistic that I read a while ago that the average freight train speed in the 40s um, was about 30 miles an hour, and the average freight train speed today is about 18 miles an hour. So if anything, that kind of shows the atrophy of the entire system. Now, why is that the case? Well, it's, it's interesting. When the railroads started to run into monetary problems, they, they got rid of passenger rail because that was um, a major issue for them. Uh, and a lot of railroads started to merge or go bankrupt, uh, and they weren't able to maintain these vast networks anymore. And the shippers along the line were drying up. They were going to uh, trucking, to short or long haul trucking. Um, obviously, because there weren't a whole lot of passenger corridors anymore, these double tracked areas weren't necessary. Some railroads had one track dedicated just for passenger service. And really, in the post-war era, um, in the 50s, the railroads just started to experience this incredible decline, both in operations and in the public mindset. People used the highways, they used uh, the airplanes, and nobody rode the trains anymore, so to speak. Um, and they just kind of dried up. So this once muscular interconnected system uh, languished and in some places disappeared completely. I like to point out to my students 
at Huntington, the uh, Erie Lackawanna Railroad used to curve right around campus, and now it's it's a it's an obvious rail corridor just kind of sitting there, and that is the shortest distance mileage-wise between Chicago and New York, and it cut right through Huntington. Mm -hmm. And the people that advocate high-speed rail, if only it weren't for that in incredible atrophy and the encroachment that's developed on top of that line, you know, we have this this wonderful trail that would make a great bike trail, but it could have been, and it once was, this really impressive uh, railroad artery at one point. And that's really, that's kind of the story of what happened, is that railroads fell out of the public eye, they fell out of the public favor, and the highways, the advent of the car and the, the trucking system is really uh, made for some really serious competition. And a r lot of railroads just didn't survive the mergers. Uh, folks can call in at 422-8708. Uh, if you've got a question for Kelly, if you've got a comment on uh, railroads, if you have an experience uh, or memory of uh, railroad history in Fort Wayne, please uh, please call in 422-8708. Um, the Fort Wayne Railroad Historical Society, physically based mm -hmm. uh, out near Cassad, New Haven, can you sort of tell how that occurred? And then as you do excursions, mm -hmm. who's uh, who's at the helm of uh, who's at the helm of the Steam engine. Right. Well, the, the, the story of the society is really a pretty incredible one, especially in the world of, of railroad preservation and, and just nonprofit uh, businesses in general. In the 70s, um, a group of college kids and, and a few other people that were aged 20 to 30 years old, they saw these two locomotives that were in these city parks. One was the 765, um, renumbered as 767 in Lawton Park, and the other was a um, Wabash locomotive number one in uh, Sweeney Park that had worked the steel industry at, off of Taylor Street for the Fort Wayne and Lake Erie and, and was renumbered number one around that time. And they said, you know, someone's got to look out after these. And the city at that point didn't have any money budgeted to repaint them or to, to keep up with them. And somebody, uh, I think, in the Board of Works Department suggested to Glenn Brendel, um, one of our founding members, uh, why, don't you, why don't you take the engine and see what you can do with it? And they said, well, maybe we can make this run. And at that point, they were one of the first all-volunteer nonprofit groups to ever consider something uh, that significant. So they took the locomotive out of the park in 1974, um, out to the edge of Ryan and Edgerton Road, and in four years, with all volunteer labor, um, without a shop or without conventional machinery, they rebuilt this locomotive to running condition. It had been out of service since 1958. It was one of the last steam locomotives, if not the last locomotive, um, to be under steam in Fort Wayne. And since then, the locomotive has had this incredible uh, career as a goodwill ambassador for the city of Fort Wayne, uh, operating these public uh, passenger excursions throughout the country. It's covered 16 states. Uh, it's hauled well over 300,000 people. Uh, 52,000 miles uh, was the uh, the mileage tally when it came into the shop in '93, when it was worn out and needed to be rebuilt again. And um, does it have its own Screen Actor Guild? <laughs> it's it's been in two movies, but it doesn't have uh, official representation. Uh, this locomotive it is a is a living, breathing time machine, uh, and it really wherever it goes, it's developed a, a following. Um, and in 1993, the society uh, located a permanent facility there in New Haven. They'd been an itinerant organization up up until then. And um, the, the engine was mothballed. It was in need of serious repair, rebuilding. The railroads uh, typically rebuilt these things every two to three years. Mm -hmm. And the work that the society um, has been doing and, and will continue to do is the same work that Fort Wayne did for, for so many years. And what they were able to do um, at the end of the 1990s was acquire a surface transportation grant to match 80% of the restoration cost uh, because it was a historic structure and it was on the, the National Register as a historic structure. And what they did was they reduced this locomotive to what we call kit form. They reduced it to its smallest components. They took off the wheels, the jacketing, the headlight. It was pieces of a locomotive all around this shop that we have in New Haven. And they had the original drawings and the blueprints from 1944 when it was built. So no one was fearful like, like a kid who takes apart <laughs> that old story of the watch? Yeah, but they at, couldn't put it back together again. At that again? point, it, with the with the experience and the knowledge that the society had developed and maintained over the years, um, this was not unheard of, but it was still very unusual. Uh, and it still, to this day, remains one of the most exhaustive, complete rebuilds of, of a locomotive of this size. Uh, and the total cost ended up being. Uh, about eight hundred thousand mm. dollars, and the volunteer hours, fifteen thousand volunteer hours over four and a half, five years, uh, mostly on weekends, with a bunch of people who just love this stuff and, and love what it does when when you take it out uh, for people. And in two thousand five, the engine was officially rebuilt, and we ran some test runs in two thousand six, and then in two thousand nine, that was our first year operating excursion since nineteen ninety three, and it was a brand new engine, looking and sounding exactly like it did when it left the plant in nineteen forty four. So we, we not only have a, a time machine, but we rebuilt the time machine and put the flux capacitor in. And <laughs> well, 
Well, now, th th there's also that old story of the fellow who's got the antique uh, shovel, and mm. he says, oh, you know, I, the candle had to, you know, I, I right, right. refashioned the handle and so on, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a genuine antique. Is the is a locomotive somewhat like that? Are there machined parts and so on? Yeah, whatever. After a while, it becomes, um, in some essence, 90%. Original or, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, the, the boiler and the frame are the most original components of the locomotive. And it's funny, the railroad would recycle. Uh, now that's interesting. The boiler would strike me as something that's under quite a bit of of stress, Heat yeah, and stress it and strain definitely that, is, that would the um, um, the firebox of the locomotive actually endures the most stress because of its rigidity in comparison to the boiler, uh, and the boiler has side sheets that you can replace over time if there are uh, th sections that are thin. And what we did, one of the first things we did when we stripped the locomotive is we did an ultrasound of the boiler and the firebox to find out how thick that steel was, and that is the original steel from 1944. And that's what's amazing; these guys built this stuff so well that it operated and operated well far beyond expectations. I mean, you took an engine um, in the 70s that hadn't been operating for so many years, you restore it outdoors, and it works. It works like it did in 1944. And now the locomotive is in as in good a condition as ever. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really amazing the fact that the, the ingenuity that went into building these things. I mean, they're Swiss watches, but they're 400-ton Swiss watches that go 60 miles an hour. Uh, pretty incredible stuff. And uh, when we take the locomotive out, um, we have a, a number of, of folks that work for the railroads full-time or part-time. Mm -hmm. uh, I work for a, a railroad in Ohio and Kentucky part-time. And the, the only federal requirement is that you have someone um, that is certified by the Federal Railroad Administration with an engineer's license. And then we have uh, our firemen and our conductors and brakemen all go through our own in-house safety training. <coughs> so that's how, we, that's how we get the wheels rolling. <laughs> when it comes to scheduling and... The railroad giving you a window of when there aren't freight trains mm -hmm. and sort of who's the air traffic controller. Right. Well, it's it's funny. I, I was describing this to uh, some friends last night, but operating this this supercharged uh, you know machine of horsepower from the 40s on a mainline railroad system, a modern railroad system, is probably one of the craziest things you can do because people aren't familiar with the machinery, even though it's just I mean it's just a locomotive when you get down to it. And our trip planning uh, takes anywhere from six to 12 months, uh, and we're very very fortunate to have this incredible relationship with Norfolk. Southern right now. They recognize that we are the goodwill ambassadors for the railroad industry. Uh, we've got great support from their, their corporate hierarchy. And without their, without their help or their cooperation, we couldn't leave New Haven there at Cassad because they're our, our connection to the world. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is we'll submit um, a plan of operations to the railroad and the host railroad. Um, and uh, a month or two later, we'll get a response and it'll go through their chain of command and we'll make sure the locomotive will fit on the line and go through the clearances and all that stuff. And, and six months later, you know, the trip happens and, and the locomotive costs anywhere from two to twelve thousand dollars a day to operate depending on what's required of it so there's just a, there's continuous planning uh, and preparation that goes on I mean this is a star that operates um, on stage for maybe 20 days a year and then it goes back and we work on it some more and we're always improving it um, but it's I mean it's a lot like having a traveling circus but in one locomotive and you've got 20 people that are that are working on it all the time I'm in politics <laughs> uh, reference to traveling circus uh, sometimes fits there too you have some ancillary uh, Pullman cars and that sort of thing as well, but I'm, there are also private uh, Pullman cars. Do they yeah, do people we, contract? Um, we'll be operating in North Judson uh, in this May, June, and July, and we're actually uh, leasing, or the, the railroad there in North Judson is leasing uh, four first-class uh, vintage cars um, from uh, a group in Indianapolis. And those are the types of things that we typically carry around us. It's not just the locomotive being this incredible sensory experience. It's what the experience of riding the train, of being on uh, a train straight out of history, so to speak. You know, the class, the romance, the elegance, um, it, just all the senses are, you know, they get a taste and a feel of what it used to be like and how glamorous in some respects it used to be. So it's not just the engine. It is, it is a, I'd say it's a traveling museum, but this is a museum that'll really get your heart raising. Who else in Indiana? I, I, Logansport used to have uh, their Iron Horse Festival, mm -hmm. which was a coal burning uh, uh, locomotive with uh, open cars. Yeah. Um, I, that is not in Logansport anymore? No, they, they. I think the last year for the Iron Horse Festival was 1996, and we actually had restored another locomotive um, that we leased from Kentucky to operate there. But at that point, 
um, the ability to operate passenger excursions with these locomotives and to conduct the excursion business was really just astronomically difficult between the insurance premiums, just how busy the railroads were. Um, not all railroads understood the merit and uh, really the benefits of the type of stuff we do to bring people uh, to understand and appreciate railroads a little bit more. So at that point, it was not just feasible to operate, and we're lucky that the engine was down at that point so we could work on it and come back now that, uh, that people really see the, the power of these things. But there are... Excuse me. There, the Indiana Transportation Museum has a steam locomotive that they operate, uh, and there's another operation, the Whitewater Valley Railroad, that operate. Um, they have a little Thomas the Tank engine that'll come up throughout the year, and they do a Polar Express train. Uh, but none of them are really comparable to the 765, just either in size or even the legacy that I think that they've developed. Um, and we've partnered with a couple of these organizations before because the rail preservation world is a small world, and even though we're there to educate and uh, and entertain people. Um, you know, we're all there to, to serve the public in some way, shape, or form, whether it's through education or recreation. So yeah, there's, there's a joke about how we can all hang together or hang separately. And we've got, sure. we've got so much stuff to bring to the table to benefit these communities uh, all around the state and throughout the Midwest. Well, and in Indianapolis, um, the line between Noblesville uh, and uh, Indianapolis has been explored of saying, we can use that today. We mm -hmm. can use that locomotive today the one that does excursions between Hamilton County mm -hmm. and uh, the state fairgrounds, mm -hmm. uh, to be used that as, as really beginning a, a commuter rail yeah. corridor using you know, the vintage equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's interesting in that particular case uh, between Fishers and Noblesville and Minneapolis. Um, it's a much more feasible and viable opportunity because the, the infrastructure is there, the railroad court is there, you have willing partners, you have willing neighbors, and you have the equipment. And all it really takes is, is an over a general vision to kind of bring together to try to put these things where they could benefit um, the community in a way that's not just historic or recreational, but actually provides a functional service, which is really important. It's a lot different than laying down rail where there was never rail before or trying to build a, a million dollar locomotive and, and trying to start up that way. Which is why there's plenty of obstacles to high-speed rail. Yeah, it's, 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 it's just amazing the obstacles that face passenger rail or high-speed rail in, in particular. And I often stress that it's not the cost, which is always going to be rather significant, but it's the culture change. People perceive transportation by rail or trains much differently than they would have before, and they don't apply the same standards to highways or air travel that they, that they would to, uh, to train travel, which is really unfortunate. Um, a lot of people say that, you know, uh, passenger rail won't make money, but you know how much money does a highway make, or how mu how much money do the airlines give back to the taxpayers who subsidize it? But yeah, it, really the culture change, um, really getting away from the car-oriented culture to a, a culture that's one of transportation options, especially when it comes to mass transit, is probably the biggest difficulty when it comes to to high-speed rail or passenger rail in general, because people just don't understand trains. And they, at traveling, I used to live in Chicago for a couple of years for college and for work, and people will enter uh, Chicago Union Station with an airport mentality, and they'll go, you know, where's Gate D? But they'll be right underneath Gate D, and they don't okay. realize how much easier it can be. And I've taken the train to Washington, D.C. numerous times, and I, I mean, there's always horror stories where a train is late, but in this case, with Amtrak between Waterloo and Washington, D.C., I was getting in 45 minutes early. To an hour early. When I took the train to Los Angeles, I was there a, a day and a half early. I mean, it's really interesting when, when it works. I mean, it works really well. Um, and it's too bad that Amtrak especially is, is being this orphan ever since um, the major railroads abandoned passenger rail and the government said we've still got to provide this service, which is what it is. It's a public service. Uh, and it's not supposed to make anybody rich. I think if quality of life projects made people rich, we'd probably live in a much different environment. <laughs> sure. 422-8708 uh, is the, the number. I've taken... Uh, the passenger service to and from Washington D.C. and from Philadelphia and from Cleveland mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, to Chicago. My uh, niece, who's now in her 20s, when she was a little girl, they lived in a uh, suburb of Philadelphia that had a commuter rail that took mm -hmm. a, uh, to Penn Station. And uh, she was so mad at my sister one time. And my and uh, they liked to pack up the family and come to Fort Wayne right. on the railroad to the Baker Street Station. She was so mad at my sister, I don't know what the argument was, mm -hmm. but she threatened that she was going to get on the train and go to Grandpa's. <laughs> uh, and, and, I, and I looked, I, I told her, I said, you must have been the last little girl in America who threatened to run away on the on train. On the train. <laughs> 
That's pretty awesome. It's it's funny living in Chicago there because there's a lot of interest in, in reinvesting in passenger rail. Uh, Chicago Union Station used to be this really incredible structure, and at one point they tore down the the waiting room, the head house of Union Station, and there's still a really cool structure there, and they built an office building on top of it. And now they're putting $40 million to essentially redevelop those waiting rooms that they had torn out years mm-hmm. ago. And it's like, you know, there's a reason why that was built so big and so well years ago. Uh, it's just funny to see that retroactive, you know, hindsight, of course, is 2020, but in this case, uh, I don't think a lot of people thought that railroads were dead, and there used to be this joke that nobody rides trains anymore, and, and I mean, even to this day, it's it's not quite true. <laughs> uh, Kelly Lynch is my guest. Uh, Kelly, we've got a caller. Sure. Uh, uh, John, are you on the line? Uh, yes, this is John Sandor. Um, I was wondering, Kelly, if uh, restored trolley cars, or do you plan on restoring there are uh, a number of car bodies, remnants of streetcars and inner urbans uh, scattered around the state. We don't own or maintain any remnants of the inner urban. Uh, there is a, a functioning operational streetcar at the Illinois Railroad Museum in Union, Illinois, uh, that operates. And it's, it's really cool because it still has the Fort Wayne stops uh, on the front of it. But we only maintain um, mainline equipment, a steam locomotive. We have two lo- steam locomotives and a couple of diesels and passenger cars. Uh, but, it, you know, if we had the facility to justify acquiring and restoring or operating a, a streetcar, that would certainly be something of interest. But unfortunately, we don't have uh, access to that equipment at this time. John, when I was a kid, very little kid because it was removed, but there was a, a converted trolley car that a lady lived in at the end of High Street that was about two blocks or three blocks away from where I grew up. Um, so a trolley car converted to uh, a residence. Yeah, we've taken our rocket ships and made them into bathtubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we sure have. <laughs> Yeah, St. Louis is is pretty incredible. Uh, it's unfortunate that with the amount of their equipment, a lot of it is 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 um, placed nose to tail, and you know there's not a whole lot of interpretive uh, materials to really go along with it. But yeah, the, the the scope of their collection is really impressive, and they have a nickel plate locomotive uh, that made its home in Fort Wayne at one point too, when they lived over in the Nebraska neighborhood. Pretty cool stuff. Yes, that that is an absolutely uh, fabulous uh, place. My daughter lived out there, and she took me there i could have spent the, the whole week there actually yep. it's, uh, it's, it's we have something incredible. in common with st louis um they have another wabash railroad steam locomotive a, a, what we would call a 260 based on how many wheels it has and we have another one uh, the sweeney park locomotive and they are the two last wabash steam locomotives mm-hmm. in the whole world left and they're both unfortunately in states of disrepair but we're hoping to change that with ours in the near future so you have that sweeney park yep uh, yeah, we took, it out of, we took it out of Sweeney Park in 1984, and, and it's actually it's been in the shop for about two years now. And, and over time, when the big engine isn't taking all of our resources, we're starting to dedicate a little more energy and perspective to that project, too. So, But the, the main issue with that locomotive and, and with a lot of other stuff that we have, I mean, we have these incredible uh, old mail cars. We have an old nickel plate uh, railway and post office car and this other stuff is we can't always justify the restoration of this equipment because we want our, our equipment to make money and justify its restoration and to be operational and not just be a museum piece, quote-unquote, where it just sits there and gathers dust, and we hope that people care about it. We like to make people care about it by experiencing it, and we could do so much more, and, and, and we will as we allocate resources to other projects uh, like the, the steam locomotive there. Um, but yeah, that's just one of the difficulties. We're lucky to not be overburdened with equipment and to be a little more selective on our restoration projects. So we can say, we can say that uh, you've got enough to do that probably the, uh, the uh, tank in uh, Johnny Appleseed Park is safe from uh, being restored to, <laughs> Certainly, yeah. to working the, order. The 765 is, is a full-time job all by itself. I mean, that is, it really is our, our, it's our biggest breadwinner, um, and it's also our biggest uh, drain on the resources, but understandably so. I mean, it's, it's like keeping a battleship running. Is, is the compensation, the activity with that uh, kind of on an upward swing? I mean, is it? something grows more valuable over the year economically to be mm-hmm. able to replenish and refresh the Every year historical society's is, activities. is really amazing. Uh, we were uh, taking the locomotive to the Cuyahoga Valley Scenic Park um, there south sure. of Cleveland. And I think there's a photo in the collection of what happened as we took the engine out. And this, this happens often, but it had never happened 
as concentrated as it did in Payne, Ohio. And uh, we were about 8,000 gallons short of water in the tender. The tender holds the, the coal in the water to make steam in the locomotive. And we needed to stop um, along the route and, and get water for the locomotive. So we called up Payne, Ohio, and we said, hey, can we use your fire hydrant? It was 20 feet away from the railroad. Mm -hmm. And that was about 7.30 at morning. And by 10 o'clock, by the time we rolled into town with the locomotive, the entire town had come out to see this. And it wasn't just the entire town. We're used to entire towns, uh, if I may be humble. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were marching the classrooms out of school, you know, s s child by child down to the railroad tracks. And I wheeled into town with the fire hoses. And it was amazing to see literally the entire town was out, plus these little clusters of classrooms and these kids that were watching this engine. And when, the, when they heard the whistle, it was like listening to kids on a roller coaster. I mean, kids were screaming. Mm. And that, the beautiful thing is, is that they didn't have to know what year it was, it was built, what the number was, where it was going, or where it was from. But this, you know, this amazing animated machine, this monster, this dinosaur was marching into town. And, I mean, that brought a lot of us close to tears because sure. that's why we do it. I mean, all those kids just going nuts at this thing every time steam came out of it or, or it made a noise. I mean, they were waving and saying happy birthday because it happened to be its mm. 66th <laughs> anniversary, you know, the day before. Uh, it was just really incredible. And that's, I mean, that's what we do. And that's the, the locomotive in, in Payne, Ohio on that day really solidified it for a lot of us. Now I've got to ask. We're going to, ho hopefully we can go to some of the sure. photographs you've mm -hmm. Uh, you brought along here in just a, just a minute. But you've got duties related to the locomotive, but you see this incredible scene happening around mm -hmm. you. Is there a struggle between the photographer and the, <laughs> it's, the railroad? It's amazing. Uh, There's always been a difficulty because for me, being a, a filmmaker, a photographer, and also a, a locomotive mechanic, I'm, I'm no huge, great, talented mechanic, but I, I especially know steam locomotives, especially when they're under steam. Uh, there is kind of a, a, a battle, you know, you know that there's a job to do, but there's also these moments that are happening. And I like to say that without photographs of the work being done, nobody can care about it. Nobody can know that it exists. And it, it would be harder to tell people about Payne, Ohio, if photos of it didn't exist. And that's, it's telling a story just like operating the locomotive is telling a story. And some people, they've joked, you know, that taking a picture isn't work, but, you know, by God, they haven't been, they haven't been to film school. <laughs> that's right. And uh, photographers, I don't... Uh... For the people who don't understand what mm. goes into it, um, they're cheap. Yeah. I mean, people are too <laughs> cheap with photographers, yep. and and we uh, uh, I hire professional photographers for our running events. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told uh, one of the photographers I, last uh, last Thanksgiving, I said, "You're not charging enough." Mm -hmm. He goes, "What?" And I said, "You're not charging <laughs> enough." I said, "I know what." Uh, I, I said, "I know what talent." My, uh, uh, is worth. my mission when I uh, became a, a director, even before that, was to make people feel the way that I felt about this, this, this machine. And the photos was just one way to introduce kind of the, the sights and the sounds sure. of something that incredible. But yeah, you're, you're right. There, occasionally there is a challenge. Well, Kelly, we've <laughs> just got about 10 minutes left. We're going to bring up some photographs, and uh, we'll, I'll just let you interpret sure. them as they, as they come up. This is the grand opening of the overpass, of the nickel plate overpass, of the Elevate the Nickel Plate project, and that's locomotive 767, uh, breaking the ribbon there. There are a lot of views of this scene, and obviously it was, it was a big deal. And we, it's something we love to recreate. Well, and with the people there, you can see this, the massive scale. Yeah, and it's amazing how many people have, have come out, and they've and to me, they pointed out you know, who's in the crowd, and they know people. Even Matt Parker said yesterday one of his old partners uh, is in the crowd there. But yeah, the locomotive, you can tell, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty gigantic. It's 16 feet tall, and it's 101 mm -hmm. feet long, if I, if I recall. And this is an example of just the, you know, what Fort Wayne looked like, uh, especially um, with the advent of these machines, the, the, the Berkshires, as we call them. Uh, the nickel plate was this little tiny tiny railroad um, that people were kind of, they thought was the underdog. And when they adopted these machines, um, it turned things around. They could take trains from Chicago to New York in 10 hours or less. Mm -hmm. Try driving that fast. Um, and this is a locomotive uh, after it was put on display. This is looking uh, at the corner of 4th and Clinton, looking south. So the river is right behind um, mm -hmm. where the locomotive is now. And it was the downtown showpiece at one point. I mean, that's exactly what people saw. And Here's the, the construction of the, the elevation, and the railroad never stopped. I mean, they tore up a track, and they were building this overpass, but the railroad kept on doing mm. what it was doing, and it still had passenger trains and freight trains. And, um, I mean, I love those two guys, you know, doing whatever they're doing up there. I mean, that's, that's a heck of a job to lift a railroad up like that. And there's, this is 4th Street. This is an example of what the Bloomingdale neighborhood was, was largely like. You can see the Science Central, the City Light and Power building in the background, the freight house that was knocked down uh, last October. 
And these are the photographer's children walking along uh, the brick platform there where they used to unload the circus train before they would march it downtown mm -hmm. into St. Liver Park. Just, you know, kind of the character of, of these places is really eminent in these photos. And this is, I mean, again, this is what Fort Wayne looked like. This is the first roundhouse uh, trick in 1933 at the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, the, all those guys are machinists, they're engineers, they're firemen, they're conductors. Their job was to, to baby these iron horses and to make them, to make them move. And this is our locomotive uh, in about 2003. Um, like I mentioned, we stripped all the parts off of it. This is after we lifted the engine up and put the wheels back underneath it after it had been machined. But that's the, the firebox is closest to us and the, the long uh, length there of the boiler. And that's, that's what a locomotive looks like in kit form, mm. just like when they were built. And this is us in, uh, in Michigan in 2009 uh, in this little Norman Rockwell S scene. Um, just heading through the uh, the Michigan countryside here with this family that was picnicking nearby, and these are some of the scenes that we've been able to recreate um, during these photograph uh, charters, where people rent the engine basically to recreate these mm. scenes right out of history, mm. um, which is just really magical. I mean, you blink your eyes and you kind of forget where you're at at some point. Uh, just more scenes from Michigan. We had a even on the caboose, we had a crew on there. They they were making breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the photographers on this pot belly stove. It was pretty cool and as Michigan again in the, in the same spot. I mean, this is what this machine looks like all the time. Um, and just, uh, it's, it's too bad we can't hear it. <laughs> I, mm -hmm, I meant to bring mm -hmm. uh, some video clips of it, but I mean, it's just the power and the majesty and the speed. Um, I mean, it was, it was, it's interesting, especially in this photo, you can see the, the white walls on the tires uh, on the drivers. And that's, th those are the kind of details that these guys stressed back in the day. They would go to great lengths on these wheels that were going to get dirty with grease and grime, and they would paint them white because they took such pride in their work at one point. Uh, pretty awesome. And then there's us. <laughs> okay. We've got a, f a few moments left. Mm -hmm. You've made quite a bit of presentations. You've talked to city council members. You've talked to various groups. Give us a little bit of your ideas for how we can interpret this heritage and celebrate this heritage and kind of reestablish Fort Wayne's sense of place, sure. a unique uh, sense of place. And, and its identity and its character, too. Uh, about a year ago, um, I incorporated this, uh, this effort, uh, this exploratory initiative called Headwaters Junction. And the idea is essentially to take this locomotive, um, the 765, something that experiences anywhere from 900 to 3,000 people a day when we take it out, uh, 50,000 people in the 16 days that we had it operating in 2009, and to make it a part of the community in a way where the locomotive and the rest of our collection is accessible, it's functional, it's operational, and to make it a part of this development called Headwaters Junction that is equal parts city park, it's equal parts attraction, there's river access, there's restaurants, there's shops, there's, you know, it's, it's a lot like the, the New York City High Line where you take this incredible stuff that's already doing these incredible things uh, outside the city and throughout the Midwest and you put them in an area where they can be a part of the Fort Wayne Institution and the experience where people can experience Fort Wayne on board a, a recreated streetcar or in an old roundhouse where this locomotive lives and breathes. Um, and I think the idea behind Headwaters Junction is to not make something that is static or, or unemotional but to engage people. I've kind of likened it, it's a lot like producing a film. Uh, you want to make a film that tells a story and engages your audience and educates them and entertains them in a way um, and, and really executes a, a really interesting immersive vision. And that's kind of the vision that Headwaters Junction has developed uh, for the old New York Central Railroad Yard there at 4th and Clinton. And it's something that's gotten a lot of positive response from the community because of the ideas uh, linked to the history of that property. Um, it's utilizing these proven assets that have this incredible following like the 765. And it would just be incredible. I mean, if a, if a city came, or a, excuse me, if a, if a family came to visit Fort Wayne in the summer and they wanted to stay downtown in a hotel and they wanted to go visit the zoo, they could walk four blocks down to Well Street and get on a streetcar and ride up to the zoo and they could catch Science Central on the way back or they could get dinner uh, on a dinner train at the end of the day or get on a boat and take a boat ride and stuff like that. And the idea is to create this institution that, that is a memory factory. It's a civic pride machine for visitors and for citizens where they can experience the history but in a way that it serves many purposes. It's something that's colorful and engaging and, and really immersive. If, if some of our viewers uh, have a group, they'd like to hear you speak about that. How do they contact sure, you? Sure, they can contact me through uh, the Fort Wayne Railroad Historical Society's website, which is fortwainerailroad.org, or they can go to headwatersjunction.com. They can learn about the plan, and my email address is on there. And I answer the phone there in New Haven, uh, which is, and the number is 260 493 zero seven six five and and i'd be happy to talk to to whomever will listen about it so <laughs> sure uh again four two two eight seven oh eight 
we've got uh, a few moments left. We could take another phone call. Um, tell us how this vision differs a little bit from what's done, say, in Pennsylvania, where they had massive uh, federal help. Right. Well, the idea with a with a plan like this, uh, it, there's there's a lot of we were kind of joking about the term uh, the catalytic investment. A plan like this isn't something that someone just comes in and they just drop money on a property and, and something springs up. This uh, it's a lot like um, redeveloping an old passenger rail corridor into an into a new passenger rail corridor. You take a a property and you recreate part of what it used to look and be like and function as and you incorporate these existing attractions like the 765 and these other things that are already successful and have a following. Um, and in Pennsylvania, uh, that locomotive that they have there, um, that was, it's, it's a really unfortunate project what happened to their locomotive. I mean, it's been under restoration for over 15 years now. But our organization has a proven history uh, sure. of, of following through on these projects and operating this locomotive. And this other organization, Headwaters Junction, would try to really give it a high profile front and center home uh, that would further our mission of serving the public um, and do it in ways uh, that really open up the doors for both a lot of funding and a lot of possibilities. There's economic development potential as an attraction, as a tourist attraction, but also as a freight railroad that serves area businesses and retains those businesses and can actually help make sites ready to draw new businesses in. So it's not just a cool place to go or a cool place to take your family, even though it, it could be, um, but it's a place that really has the meat and potatoes of an economic, economic development project that goes far beyond just being a really cool place to visit. One of the things we looked at in the Economic Development Alliance, but also a, one of the founding board members for the Maumee Valley Heritage Corridor, is really sort of telling the tale mm -hmm. of the whole uh, Maumee Valley and, and the layers of history uh, for the Maumee Valley is that it's a history of transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, use of the river, the, the Wabash and Erie Canal, and then followed by the railroads. Yeah. Um, and how it ties uh, this whole corridor in together, uh, how important this is for the establishment of the Northwest Territory. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of history to be told here, and yeah. I think we've I think we've kind of lost a little bit of that in yeah, uh, and, and it's it's Fort a story Wayne. worth and, telling. And Fort Wayne has become, uh, you know, for folks who've relocated elsewhere, uh, a place that's indistinguishable yeah. from others. The suburbanization and the malls, uh, something that tells people history happened here. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for this place. Yeah. There's a there's a sense of pride in the in the community, and I appreciate your efforts on behalf. Uh, really the whole city of uh, trying to get this project started and get the discussion started. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the, the feedback that I've gotten. I feel very fortunate to have walked into this ongoing conversation about how to improve and redevelop and reinvent the city and the region, and it's been amazing to be a part of that conversation with this project. Again, you're one of the under 30 people. You're, <laughs> you're going to live in this community uh, 30 and 40 and 50 years out. Um, thank you, Kelly Lynch, yeah, for being on you, the Mitch. program. <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, gave you the contact information. Uh, next month we'll be having, uh, we'll also be talking a little, about, a little bit about history, but it'll be uh, history directly related uh, in the 4th District, in the Waynedale neighborhood. The Waynedale uh, news publishers are coming out with a history book yeah. uh, on the history cool. of uh, Waynedale, and we'll be talking about that, and hopefully uh, folks can call in with their stories uh, about Waynedale growing up there and uh, discussion of, of how that grew. Uh, appreciate uh, folks listening in on council call-in. We'll be back uh, uh, next month. If you need to call me as your councilman, uh, Mitch V. Harper at Gmail. It's available on the uh, uh, city website. And uh, either 348-5343, that is my cell phone number, 348-5343, uh, to contact me with, uh, with city concern. Thank you very much for joining us.